Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we're going to be reading a whole bunch of different types of true scary stories. When I start making these particular videos, I never know what I'm going to be getting into. These stories could be paranormal, crime related, or anything else that makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. So I hope you enjoy them. So without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true scary stories. So for context, my house is right beside some woods a small, probably one mile by one mile patch of woods. My parents and I were sitting on our patio at night a few weeks ago. My parents were drinking beer and I was outside just on my phone. On the few weekend nights we all have off together, we like to spend time together on our patio at night and just shoot the breeze for a while. So anyways, my dad had went to bed, so it was just me and my mom, and we were cleaning up some empty beer bottles while finishing up our conversation. My mom walked around the side of the house to throw some bottles in our outdoor garbage can. I was standing alone checking my phone, and I heard a scream coming from the woods. There's a shed in those woods junkies and homeless people are known to sleep slash set up camp at, so I thought it was just some crazy person screeching, and I ignored it. Thirty or so seconds later, I hear it again. I look up and turn on my phone flashlight, pointing it into the woods, but I couldn't see anything. My mom came back and asked what was wrong, since she must have seen the freaked out look on my face. I started to explain, and halfway through my sentence it happened again, but this time it was a girl's voice. She was screaming for help and yelling for someone to help her. My mom and I believe in and take every measure possible to avoid skinwalkers. So my mom and I gathered the rest of our stuff and started hurrying inside. I turned my back away from the woods and I heard the same voice say, Hey you, come here. And I kid you not, it sounded like it was two feet away from me. I almost crapped myself, so I pushed my mom inside and ran in behind her as fast as I could. I've never shut a door so quickly in my life. But anyway, that's my scary story. When I was around 21, I got divorced from my son's father and moved back home. Me and my son, who was around 15 months old, didn't have any space there, so I was looking to move out as soon as possible. My best friend's sister just rented a house and was looking for a roommate. So, long story short, we ended up moving in with her and her five-year-old daughter. Everything was great at first. Then little things would start happening, like the lights being on when I thought that I had turned them off. The washing machine lit up and not washing clothes, even when I swore that I'd closed it. Then one day, I came home from work and my roommate's praying beads were in the mailbox. I asked her why she put them there, and she said that she didn't, but maybe her daughter somehow did. So, some time passes with these little odd occurrences happening. One night, we decided we're gonna go out. My son is with his dad, and she calls her cousin to come over and babysit. We're telling him about all the strange things that have been noticed and he says something about not being scared of no ghost. Right as he said that, a glass that was on a bookshelf flew across the room and hit him. So we freak out, and being that we are young, single moms who don't want to go back home, we kind of just push it out of our minds. We decided to get two puppies for our kids. I swear you may think that I'm lying, but they never grew an inch while we were there. Then there would be magnets in the sink for no reason, Things started to escalate fast. One weekend when the kids were at their father's house, me and my roommate decided to clean the kids' playroom. The next morning, it was a disaster again. And remember, the kids were gone for the weekend. At this point, I was scared to even come home. One night I was in my bed, she was in hers, and we heard knocking on the windows outside. We both had toxic exes and thought it might be one of them, so we called the police. 
They came out and nothing. They said it didn't look like anyone was ever there. We decided it was time to move. And as much as I didn't want to, I had to move back home. When the kids started to get hurt, my roommate's daughter cut herself on a mirror that came from nowhere. My son fell out of a chair and busted his face. He got really bad nosebleeds out of nowhere. While we were moving, a huge mirror that was anchored to the wall fell and busted on my back. A lot of things happened in that house. The old man that lived across the street told us that no one ever lived there long. After my Grammy passed away back when I was in middle school, my grandpa came to live with us, my mom, stepdad, brother, and I. He lived with us until he passed away when I was in junior high school. He passed away in the house, and a lot of strange things happened after that, when we still had his ashes for some time, because we were trying to get the whole family together to go lay him to rest at his favorite lake. But that's another story. So skip forward to the year 2017, my daughter and I were sleeping in my parents' bedroom, as they were out of town and they were the only one with an AC unit in their room, so we were definitely taking advantage. It was a normal night. I had work the next day. My daughter had school, so we were already in bed. My brother was also still living there, and home at that time. Around 11 p.m., I hear someone banging the kitchen cabinets very loudly. I mean loud enough to wake me up, and I remember thinking, geez... Why is my brother slamming things around in the kitchen like that? This continued for some time. Things getting banged around very loudly. But I was kind of in a half-sleep fog, so I just went back to sleep. The next morning, I get up. And right away, I think how weird all that was last night. As I open the door to use the restroom, my brother opens his door at the same time. His room is right across the very small hallway from my parents. And we both jumped and scared each other. I ask him immediately, Hey, why were you slamming things around in the kitchen last night? He responds with, I was about to ask you the same question. So we were like, oh my God, that's weird. But I remember I said a lot of strange things happened after my grandpa passed. So we just shrugged it off. But it was still very weird. Especially after I checked the kitchen and it looks completely normal. So I'm driving to work and I get a call from my uncle and he tells me that my cousin has been struck by a car last night, and he did not make it. Of course, I was shocked, and I called my other cousin, his sister, and went straight to her house. I asked her, how did this happen? When? And she replied that it happened around 11 p.m. last night. Same time all of that stuff happened in our house. We like to think that it was our grandpa trying to wake us up, to let us know that one of his grandkids was in trouble. I don't know. In my mind, it's just too strange to be a coincidence. Gunner is my six-month-old German Shepherd, and he is just shy of 30 kilograms. Everywhere I go with him without fail, there is always someone who tells me how important it is to have him socialized, as German Shepherds can become dangerous. Even the vet, every single time, pushes to ensure that I train even the slightest sign of aggression out of him, early, but following this. I don't care, but I digress. On with the story. Early this evening, just as the sun was beginning to set, I was getting something from my car parked on the street out the front of my home. My eldest son, who is about 16, but as he was a preemie all those years ago and having related health issues due to that is only around five foot two and barely 50 kilograms with not an ounce of muscle on him, had come out with Gunner as he was taking him for a walk. As I was walking back towards the house and my son had crossed the road, I noticed a man heading in the same direction as my son. No big deal. You'd think they're just someone walking by, right? Except he failed to notice me standing at my front gate, said something I couldn't make out. And right before my eyes, I see this man speed up almost to a run and slide his hood over his head as he was quickly approaching my son. A nightmare for any parent, 
and a danger that you would never expect only four houses from your own. As useless as I am, I froze. Please don't come at me. I hate myself enough, but we cannot control a fear response, no matter how much we wish we can. I watched on with dread that I've never felt. The moment the guy slides his hood up over his head and sped up with intent, I just knew that his intentions were to harm my son, who was oblivious to his surroundings, fiddling with his phones with earbuds in. As I'm guessing, trying to find the right song to match his walk. Right as the man was within arm's reach of my son, and his body language made it blatantly obvious that he was going to, in the very least, grab my son as he began reaching out his arm, the goodest boy gunner swung around in front of my son to in between he and the man and let out a bark I wasn't aware that a puppy could make. Gunner began towards the man barking and growling as the man hadn't stopped with his first bark. I watched frozen with horror when my dog then put all of his weight into pulling my son further away and getting himself closer to the man who decided at the last second not to take on the dog guarding my son. The man then flicked his hood back down and proceeded to continue on his path after stepping back and away from my son, yelling back at my son to get that dog under control. Finally, my feet unfroze, and I jumped in my car following my son and the dog around the block until they got home, just to make sure the guy didn't double back or come out from another street to have another go. So please, never let your guard down, no matter how close to home you are, or even if the sun is still out and always be aware of your surroundings. I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that man intended on hurting my son, and had it not been for the goodest boy gunner, this would have played out very horrifyingly different. This story is rather weird, and is a currently continuous thing. Going to bed has always been a safe haven for me until I move to a new house. I share a room with my sister and two dogs, which is fine by me, and that seems to be the only way that I can sleep in this house. One night sleeping, I get this weird guttural feeling, as if someone was going to do something to me. It was as if someone was hovering over my bed watching me. At this point I was asleep, but I woke up to this feeling. I could move and such, but I didn't open my eyes. Something told me not to. I quickly ducked my head and feet under my blanket and shook uncontrollably until the feeling was gone. A few nights later, I get the same feeling, but I had no idea what it was. I was already under my cover suffocating, thinking this was going to happen again. I wanted to know what made me feel like this, so I opened a small covering under the blanket to let some light through. I have a walk-in closet that has no door and leads to the bathroom. My bed is on the opposite side of the room from it. I look in the general area and see a man in black sort of just sitting there. He was huge, literally almost as tall as my closet with oddly squared shoulders. I was so scared I didn't even blink. What made it worse was that my largest dog was also looking in that general area, alert. The man was just there standing in the corner next to my sister's bed. I pull the covers back over my head and don't move until the feeling is gone. At first I thought this was a dream, until I told my sister about the incident and she goes, You saw him too? I'm still freaked out and scared about it. Not to mention when I'm just chilling in certain areas and such, I feel like someone is watching me. I turn around quickly, and as soon as I turn around someone is smiling and ducking behind a corner. There are more things to tell, but these things still sort of happen and are gut-wrenching, and I live in fear of my own house every day. So this isn't a super intense story. No shadow people or terrible dreams or whatever, but it was deeply odd. A long time ago, I worked at a clothing store that sold both clothes and shoes. It had a sizable back of house as well. When I arrived there, it didn't take long for my co-workers to tell me they thought it was haunted. I kind of brushed it off as people messing with the new person. But I soon started to think that they were right. For starters, this particular place always made me feel like someone was watching me, even during the day. 
It wasn't the vibe you get from a customer who is simply looking at you. I haven't been stalked, but I imagine it's how you'd feel if you suspected you had a stalker. If I stayed late at night to help us get caught up processing shipment, the feeling got way creepier. I'd turn lighthearted shows on with my Netflix app just to dispel the unsettling feeling. One day I was working with two co-workers, one about 19 or 20, the other about 25. We wore walkie-talkies, and I was in the back getting shoes while the other two were helping customers out front. All of a sudden, I heard a young girl's voice, sounded like she couldn't have been older than maybe 10, saying something unintelligible through my earpiece. My two co-workers, both female, didn't have that high-pitched of a voice. They actually both came back to where I was and were like, what was that? Very strange. Maybe a kid playing with their own walkie-talkie, but it sure was bizarre. Never happened before or since. Other co-workers reported shoes falling off of display shelves for no reason, even if there wasn't anyone close by. The wall holding them also didn't border any other buildings. I saw this happen too, with sturdy shelves. I heard a man's voice go, hey, in my ear in a loud whisper one day. It was deeper than that of my male co-worker or the man that he was speaking to. Another co-worker said that one morning he was opening the store alone. He heard what sounded like a man's heavy footsteps running on the wooden floor. The co-worker rushed to the sales floor, only to find himself still totally alone. Kind of a spooky place in general, to be honest. Over 10 years ago, me and my family lived in this small two-story apartment building. Most of the unexplained occurrences in my life happened there. I tell my mom to this day that place had to be haunted. The more I tried to logically make sense of some of these happenings, the less logical it appeared. My younger sister and I, ages 15 and 13, shared a room in bunk beds. We had a ceiling fan and one of those large plastic floor fans that are usually gray in color and you power it on from a knob on the back. Naturally, being the eldest, I slept on the top bunk. We had one window, but our apartment building was built extremely close to the building next to us, so there was no view of outside, and there was no natural light. The only view from our window was the brick wall of the adjacent building. One night, in the dead of night, suddenly there were loud noises coming from what sounded like the floor fan. It sounded as if a full-grown adult were either repeatedly slamming the fan on the floor or jumping on it like they were jumping on a trampoline. The noise shook me out of sleep, and my voice died in my throat. When the noise died down, I tried to swear that I was still asleep and I was having a weird, reckless dream, until my sister said, What was that? The light could be turned on from the ceiling fan latch, so that's what I did before cautiously peeking off the rail of the bed and down at the floor where the fan sat perfectly intact with no power. From the sounds, I expected the fan to be in bits and pieces, or I assumed that it was powered on and something happened with the fan blades to make it unstable or something. Me and my sister stayed up for hours that night, not able to logically explain what happened. Because she was nearest, I asked if she saw anything, and she said that she didn't, but she heard it. Our room was always pitch black at night if we kept the door closed. I asked questions about what she heard to confirm if it was the same sounds that I had heard, and she described the same sound exactly as I had. She said it sounded as if the fan were being smashed onto the floor right in front of her, but we didn't see or feel anything. To this day, all I can say is, what the hell? Like, what was that? Here's another short experience in the same apartment. One evening, in the living room, the farthest part of the house from my parents' room, where my dad slept because he had to get up for the graveyard shift, I heard someone call my name. I had only briefly walked into the living room to grab something. I didn't need to turn the light on, but I heard my name clear as day. It wasn't whispered and it wasn't screamed. It was spoken as if someone close wanted my attention. Unsuspectingly, I responded with, Yes, Mika? I assumed it was her since her bedroom was located behind a door in the living room, and the voice sounded feminine, almost familiar too. Mika's my cousin, by the way. Her door was open, lights out. I walked inside, turned the lights on. 
No one was there. The only other person in the house with me was my dad, and he was fast asleep. None of the family members that lived there with me, besides that one experience me and my sister shared, ever had anything unusual happen to them, or around them. I wanted to share an experience that I had back in the spring of 2018. I've had a few that could be considered paranormal experiences in my life, but this was the most recent and unnerving. I'm an avid outdoorsman and love to hunt and camp around the Francis Marion and Sumter National Forest. Back in 2018, I took my young son and dog out to a remote area in the National Forest. Back in 2018, I took my young son and dog out to a remote area in the National Forest to test out a new camper shell on my recently purchased truck. We found a secluded area off a dirt road, made dinner, and then packed it in for the night as soon as it got dark. Around 11 p.m. that night, I sat up and looked out the back of the truck due to my growling dog. In the distance, I saw what looked like hundreds of small white balls of light darting around, then hovering for a few seconds and slowly converging to our campsite. They looked just like the dust orbs that you see on videos, but these were producing light in a completely dark forest. They soon surrounded my truck, seemed like hundreds of them. They were a soft white light, and they didn't blink. Lightning bugs were out early evening, but those were yellow and blinking. After 30 minutes of them floating around and concentrating around us, I finally worked up the nerve to open the truck, and I lit a lantern, and they promptly disappeared. After turning off the lights and locking back up, they came back. My son was fast asleep, thank goodness. I watched them until I finally slept around 1 a.m. The next morning when we tried to leave, the battery was dead on the truck. There wasn't any lights in the back cab where we would have used any power. A week later, I had to replace the electrical control module. Not sure if that is relevant info, but thought I would add it. Has anyone had a similar experience? Just thinking about them again makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. For context, I'm an 18-year-old female, and I live in a small town near Houston, Texas. It's about 40 to 50 miles away from the city. I live in a nice, safe, middle-class, small neighborhood with a bunch of old, retired people in it. The neighborhood is really small, only with seven streets. I'm in college, living with my parents and older sister. Our neighborhood has a nice hotel in it, and there are cops patrolling the neighborhood because of this. So anyway, this happened to me about two months ago. My parents left me and my sister home alone for a week to go on a road trip during spring break. It was my first time ever being alone in the house with no adult for so long. No big deal. I wasn't a high schooler anymore. I would keep myself alive and the house clean and free of parties and just continued going to work and school like normal. It was the second night of my parents' departure and they were in New Mexico at this point. My sister has a boyfriend, so she spent a lot of time over at his house. I have a boyfriend as well, but he works all the time, so I found myself at home alone and bored around 5 p.m. I decided to go to the gym, which the hotel in my neighborhood has one, so I got all my stuff and headed out the door. My mom has a weird fear of someone trying to open all our windows and doors while we're asleep and kill us, so she's a heckler about locking things. I only lock the door if I'm leaving the house unoccupied for a long period of time, though. When I was leaving, I got a strange feeling to lock the front and back door. I was going to ignore it, but it kept bugging at me, so I went back inside and locked the front and back door. I also wanted to run to the gym, but at the last minute before walking out the door, I got a sudden sense of laziness and went to get my keys, which is when I got the feeling to lock the door. No big deal. I'm not good with intuition and I'm a paranoid person, so I didn't think too much of it. I go to the gym for about an hour and a half, and while I'm there I get this random, terrible, gut-wrenching feeling that gives me bad anxiety. Now, I have a dog, and again, like I said, I'm a paranoid person, so my mind instantly went to the fact that my house is on fire and my dog is trapped inside because I locked both of the doors and no one is going to be able to save him. Stupid, I know. In fact, so stupid that I didn't think it was actually possible, 
and I stayed and continued my workout at the gym with a lingering feeling of anxiety. I get done and I head home. And of course, when I get home in like two minutes, my house is still intact. I get out and start heading inside, but I notice something on my front door handle. My door handle is curved into a long C that attaches to the wood with a latch on top of the C that you have to press with your thumb to open the door. Wrapped tightly around my door handle was a brown napkin that wasn't there when I locked the door before I left for the gym. I stopped instantly and thought of the recent fentanyl poisonings, how people were putting liquid fentanyl on napkins and money, killing the people who came in contact with them with an overdose. I called my parents who answered and explained what happened. My mom was a bit spooked and told me not to touch it, while my dad was trying to be rational, telling me that it was probably just an advertisement that someone put on our door. That's clearly not what it was, but I got some gloves out of my car and used them to take the brown napkin off. It was clear that it wasn't an ad, even if it had maybe been ripped off. It had the texture of a thick paper bag, but I didn't look at it long enough to see exactly what it was. I threw it instantly on the ground, unlocked the door, cleaned the handles with Clorox wipes and the lock and keys and my hands, and then I washed the gloves. I left the paper bag on the ground for a while while I stayed locked up in my house, not knowing what to do with it. I kept looking outside of the windows because I just knew someone had come and put that on our door, and I was wondering if they were still out there. I never saw anything or anyone, or even got a weird feeling of being watched. My sister and her boyfriend got home and I got some courage, put some more gloves on and went to go pick up and examine the brown paper bag with them. I brought it inside and we all looked at it underneath the light. It was 100% clearly a small brown paper bag. It looked like something a restaurant would put sauces or silverware in for to-go orders. It was crumpled up due to how tightly it was wrapped around the door handle, so I unfolded it. I almost dropped the paper bag again because what I saw on it scared me. It was a clear, thick liquid that kind of resembled snot smeared across the part of the paper bag that was touching the door handle. My sister, her boyfriend, and I kind of stayed silent, all thinking the same thing, fentanyl. But the longer time passes, the more I think about what it really could have been. Nothing weird or strange has happened since then. I highly doubt we have druggies in our neighborhood that would just come up on our door with a high whim and stick trash in it. I question if it was truly fentanyl. I mentioned me living in Houston because it was one of the biggest hot spots of trafficking in the country, and I'm curious to know if that may be anything to do with it. Perhaps they're marking my house, or maybe it's nothing. I don't think it's nothing though because someone intentionally came and put that brown paper bag on our door and got the heck out of there during the short time while I was at the gym. I wish I had a ring camera so that I had more answers, but I don't. Do you have any answers for me? These questions always go on in the back of my head. I'm sure, of course, you don't have the full answer, but what could this mean? And why did it happen? For context, I live in a very rural area in the Midwestern part of the United States about 20 minutes away from the nearest town and about six minutes from the nearest township. For those of you who have lived in the sticks, you know as well as I do that creepy sounds and sightings that make you second guess what you saw are commonplace if you spend any amount of time outdoors at night. It was 3.30 on a Saturday morning. I was driving home alone from a party on a small lightless country road leading out of the nearest township to my house. There are two cemeteries the old cemetery and the one that they still actively plant people in. These cemeteries are on either side of the road and are about 200 feet from each other or roughly 61 meters. I had just passed the second cemetery and taken a curve into a part of the forest that was especially dense. No moonlight penetrated the canopy of the trees that reached across the road. I slowed down in case a deer decided to jump out in front of me, as was frequent in that area. That's when I saw it. There was a large dark mass in the middle of the road. At first I thought perhaps it was a limb or a dog of some sort, but as my headlights illuminated the creature, I knew all too well that this was abnormal at best. There, standing in the road was a large black bird, the size of a vulture or eagle, however it had no head. Now as an educated hillbilly, I know full well that when a bird roosts, it tucks its head under its wings, in many cases 
and that could fully explain this. That's what logic and reason would tell you. Although I have never known a bird to roost on the ground, let alone in the middle of a road. I stopped my jeep about 10 yards from the bird with my headlights illuminating it. I sat and pondered the situation for a moment and honked to see if it would startle the bird into flying away. It did not stir. I sat for a moment longer and this horrible sense of dread filled my soul. I then decided to drive carefully around the sleeping bird. I stopped and rolled down my window and shone a light down on it to get a better look up close. Instead of finding a tucked head, I looked down the bloody gullet of a decapitated specimen. From there, I must admit my terror was real, and I made haste in leaving this unsavory omen behind. The next morning, the bird was gone without a trace. Okay, so I used to live in a small town in rural Canada. There was this old folks home for the mentally unwell that was closed a long time before I moved there. During the day, people would go on the property and hang out in the well-kept grass and trees. The town still took care of the surrounding grounds for this specific reason. The actual building was locked up, but teenagers would break into the building to basically scare themselves, myself included on a few occasions. Usually with five or so people, little drunk or a bit high, but even stone cold sober it was lots of fun, probably due to feeling somewhat safe in numbers, and literally nothing actually happened that couldn't be easily explained with logic, noises, papers shifting, etc. Inevitably, the large group of teens that we were would make too much noise and the cops would get called. One night, me and my best friend, whom is a serious skeptic, decided to break slash get into a part of the building we knew hadn't been gotten into by anyone. This time it was just the two of us, because the more people you bring, the more likely the police are to show up due to a disturbance being called in by someone living across from the property. We've had to book it from the cops before and we didn't want to tonight, especially if we were going to a place that no one had been before, where we didn't know the exits. To get an idea of what it looks like, five stories tall with the fourth and fifth stories making a slight lower jutting out from the middle. Old brick in the front, modern cement blocks that were painted over, like in schools, at the back where you could tell stuff was added in years later. The newer parts of the building had been broken into by kids a lot, but the main building had thick metal doors and the windows that might be able to be opened were on the third story. It looked like an old school church asylum got cobbled together. There were other little structures around the main building, pool house, gymnasium, all ransacked by us idiot kids. Not the main floor of the old building though. We climbed on the roof of the boiler room at the back of the building by piling up furniture debris we found in one of the ransacked storage boxes behind the main building. We pulled off one of the plywood covers nailed over a hole in the roof for a skylight or a missing vent, not sure, that led into the boiler room and used the pipes along the ceiling and walls to climb down. This part of the building still looked semi-modern, and you could tell was added closer to when it was closed. There was an exit that only opened from the inside, so at least leaving would be easy if needed. Me and my buddy are pumped at this point. The pipes made it easy to get down, and everything was going as good as it could. We made our way to the back of the room, and find the door leading to the untouched main floor of the building. We're half expecting the door to be locked like the other thick metal ones, but I opened with an achy, loud against the silence creak. The door opened to the middle of a hallway leading left or right. First thing we noticed, dust, everywhere. It made a quarter inch film on everything. We both went right as it led into an interesting looking main area with sheet covered furniture. We used our phone screens as light and took a couple steps into the main room and it hit me like a train. I'll try my best to phrase this understandably. All of a sudden I feel sick. Not throw up sick, but like I'm gonna die sick. Like my brain said, run, leave, escape, now. I started shaking for no reason. It was so jarring. If I had to compare it to something, it felt like someone was right behind me with the intent to end me. It was weird because of how sudden it was, like a switch went off. I was excited and positive, 
right up to the point where I was convinced we were about to get jumped or murdered. I looked at my buddy and his face had the same expression of what I felt, genuinely terrified, white as a ghost. I think that might have scared me even more honestly because I've never seen him like that. Remember, neither of us saw anything at this point. No ghosts, no distinct noises after the door creak, no creepy dolls or skeletons. Just thick dust and sheet-covered furniture. It made no sense that I felt so threatened, and looking at my friend, I knew he felt it too. Without saying a word to each other, we turn on our heels and run towards the boiler room. We didn't tell each other that either of us wanted to go. We just started backtracking faster than we came in. I'm leading us at this point, and my blood ran ice cold when I noticed something on the other side of the room we left open. A set of fresh-looking footprints that led down to the left root of the hall. We both went right to get the large main room. The prints were positively not ours. As we got closer, it got worse. The footprints started 8 to 10 feet from the door, in the middle of the hall. It looked like a person teleported 10 feet from the door mid-stride, and walked the opposite way and around the corner. We booked it out of there as fast as possible. Thank God there was an exit in the boiler room because I can't imagine climbing up those pipes in that panic. Literally never went back to that building. I asked my buddy what he saw on the way back to his house and he said he saw the prints and noticed how far they were from the door. So I know that I wasn't seeing things. I'm an atheist. I don't have a good explanation for this and I really love one. To clarify, we didn't see them appear. We saw them after they had been made, and they looked as new as ours. Bonus fact, the tower had a window at the top, and some people claimed that they could see someone standing in it at night sometimes. There was a couple times when I swear something looked like it could be in the window before this whole incident happened, but it could easily just be my mind playing tricks. I grew up in New York, and my family has a vacation house in Albany that we go to whenever we have free time. I don't get there much anymore because I'm in my 20s and I'm busier with work. Also, I have some bad memories of the house, so I prefer not to sleep there. The house is big and really beautiful. It's by a lake, and it was actually a new build, so it's updated. I never liked it as a kid because of things that I saw. During the day at the house was cool. Outside was nice and big, and sometimes my brother and I would play in the lake. At night, things would get really quiet, though, and the rooms didn't feel right. My brother and I would hear tapping on the walls, see flashes of light out of the corner of our eyes, and sometimes we would smell dirt. I hated the dirt and soil smell. When we smelled the dirt, we would see a girl, maybe late teens, in the hall by our room. Her face was purple. She didn't seem to notice us just ignored us, kept walking around. She never really came close to us, never said anything. She just walked around and her face was purple. The craziest memories I have are of the dirt smell, the silent rooms and her just walking around. When my brother and I got a little older, we tried to see if anyone died on the land or the lake, but we couldn't find anything. I do think someone suffocated or drowned in the lake because of the way she looked. I don't really like going back to that house, but my brother goes. He and I haven't seen her since we were little, 13 or so. But whenever we are both there, we both agree that we smell dirt at night. Edit. If anyone lives in the Albany area and has any info on history of the area, I can give the area of Albany where the house is. Not the address, but the area. I'd like to see if there was anything that happened in the area that could be connected. It was a typical busy night in New York City, and I was driving my cab like any other night, picking up passengers and taking them to their destinations. But as the night went on, things took a dark turn. I received a ride request from a location in a relatively quiet part of town. As I arrived at the pickup location, I noticed a tall and mysterious figure standing in the shadows. It was difficult to see their face, 
but they looked like they were wearing a long black coat and a hat pulled low over their eyes. I couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman. As the figure got into my cab, I felt a sense of unease wash over me. The figure didn't speak, and I couldn't see their face in my dimly lit cab. The only sound was the hum of the engine as we drove into the night. Suddenly, the figure spoke, but it wasn't in a language that I recognized. It was guttural and sounded like it was coming from deep within their throat. I couldn't understand a word they said, and I started to feel uneasy. As we drove further into the city, the figure's behavior became more erratic. They started to mutter and mumble to themselves, and then suddenly they began to scream. It was a blood-curdling scream that chilled me to the bone. I tried to stay calm and focused on the road, but my heart was racing and my hands were shaking. The figure then reached into their coat and pulled out a long and sharp-looking knife. They began to wave it around, screaming and muttering in that same incomprehensible language. I knew I was in serious trouble. I tried to keep the cab moving while also trying to keep an eye on the figure in the back seat. But then, in a split second, they lunged at me with a knife. I managed to dodge the attack, but in the process, I lost control of the cab and it crashed into a nearby building. I was badly injured and barely conscious, but I remember the figure getting out of the cab and walking away, disappearing into the darkness. I never saw their face and I never heard that language again. That experience scarred me for life. Every time I get a ride request, I can't help but feel anxious and afraid. I'll never forget that night, and I'll never forget the terrifying figure that haunted my cab. I'm a 19-year-old female who is renting a place with my friends. It had been three days since moving into my new place, and I was home alone for the week. Everything was pretty normal, and I did my routine check to make sure all my doors and windows were locked before heading to bed. I woke up at 1 a.m. to someone banging on my door and yelling something. I couldn't tell what they were saying because their words were all slurred, but I could tell it was a man. I could also hear a female, so he wasn't alone. I hid in my room with my blinds shut, and bedroom door locked while I called the police. They left while I was calling because they thought no one was home, but I asked the police to come anyway just in case. When they arrived, I went to the front door to answer, and when I opened it, it was covered in blood. It was splattered everywhere and had begun pulling at the base of my door. The policeman asked me to no longer touch the front door and talk to him from the side door. There was so much blood, I thought someone was murdered at my door and that they weren't breaking in but calling for help. The policeman called for more police officers and they searched the area with dogs and found no one. They later determined that it was fish blood and I talked to my neighbor, this was our first time meeting, the next day who had taken a video. You couldn't see their faces but I found out it was actually two girls and a man. They also had a bag which probably contained whatever they used to drench my porch in blood. One of, if not the craziest night of my life, ended with the police officer wishing me luck on cleaning up the blood the next morning. I did some googling on how to clean up blood, baking soda and vinegar, and went to the grocery store in the morning to get the supplies and some gloves. I didn't want to risk touching the blood. My porch was all white, so it was still a bit discolored until the day after when I went over it with a multi-service cleaning bleach spray. The grocery store lady did comment on all the cleaning supplies, and I told her that my house was the victim of a bad prank. I also had a neighborhood mom and her son come talk to me while I was cleaning the blood. So it's been a great way to introduce myself to my neighbors. A couple of years before the COVID lockdowns, my wife used to have a weird work schedule where she worked most Saturdays so our weekends were kind of split. I only mentioned COVID above because that's when her weird schedule changed and we didn't have the weird schedule anymore. So whenever there was a Saturday or Sunday where I was home alone with our son, who was about seven at the time this event happened, I used to take him on little adventures. One time we found a book that was made by a historical society to promote kids into visiting little unknown museums in our state. 
this book had a lot of places I've never even heard of, and I've lived here my entire life. I'm also an older dad on average, about eight to 10 years older than most dads in my son's age range. I only mention that because I'm not really one of those dads who will do a lot of the theme parks and that kind of stuff. I actually don't like crowds or waiting in line, and I attribute that to me being an old dad. I do love history. So when we got that book about the little known museums in the state, we set out to try and visit nearly every one. My son always loved our adventures together because we would say it was a boy's day out. I guess that was to make him feel okay that mommy wasn't joining us. Anyway, sorry for the rambling, but here goes the heart of the story. One day we picked a museum that had to do with a family who settled in the area and became wealthy due to oil, but also suffered lots of deaths and hardship. That morning I made us breakfast, and then we put on comfortable clothing and shoes and packed some snacks for the road. We arrived to the museum and, to be honest, it wasn't at all what I was expecting. The area was surrounded by massive complexes of industrial buildings, but hidden way back was this pretty big track of open land that had a museum, a gift shop, a cemetery, and a bunch of other buildings in the grand house. We paid the donation for the house and the grounds tour, and it had a bunch of old farm equipment and the typical kind of museum objects that were all from shortly after the Civil War to the turn of the century, um, the 1800s to 1900s. We were in a group of all adults, and my son was the only kid on the tour. Most of the people were actually older than me. There was an Asian family, not sure where they were from, but they didn't speak English. But they all seemed really nice and enjoy seeing the Old West stuff. There was another family who looked like siblings and a mom, an older middle-aged couple and a few single people on our tour. Everything was going fine, no issues as we were doing the grounds tour, talking about old farm life and ranch life. The tour guide was talking about all the cattle and how the original deed had land going all the way out past the freeway and almost out towards the next county over. So the original family land was very vast and probably very lonely to the original settling family. As soon as we entered the main house, one of the ladies who was with us started acting like she was having a fit. She looked really normal about in her mid-40s. If I had to describe her, I would say PTA president looking. From what I remembered, she stayed back by the entry door and did her best not to make a scene. When we moved from that entryway to the main parlor, she seemed like she was starting to cry in a silent whimper, and then she started shaking. It didn't look like she was having a medical emergency, but it looked like if she just found out someone had died or something. She looked like a split between extreme sadness and scared as she was shaking and she started to look really pale. Finally, another lady said, are you okay? And she blurted out, I need to get out of here. The tour guide stopped the tour and said, ma'am, I can't let you out alone, nor can I leave the tour alone. So everyone in the tour is going to have to follow me to let you out. We were all like, yeah, of course. Everyone had concern for her. As we leave the house and make our way to the parking lot and to the locked gate, I noticed her collar came back and she started looking better. She exited the gate and just right outside there was a bench and she sat there and started to cry. Our tour guide went to check on her and asked if she needed them to call 911. She said no, but she didn't know what came over her and she never had a reaction like that before. The tour guide had actually said, well, you're not the first one to have a reaction to the house, but please check in with the museum if you need water or if you want to sit inside for a bit. The lady said, no, I'm fine. I'm just going to go home. The tour guide came back in the gates and apologized to us for not allowing us to stay in the house alone. As she was talking, I saw the lady get up from the bench and fast walk almost like in fear back to her car. It was like if it was midnight and she was in a dark parking lot, kind of a rushed back to her car. Eventually, we all return to the house and go into the parlor. It was a formal setting area with old 1800s furniture and a pistol in a case over the mantel. One of the guys on the tour had asked a question that I'm sure it was all in our minds. What did you mean when you said that she wasn't the first one to have a reaction inside the house? That's when the tour took a dark turn. Apparently, back in the late 1800s, the owner of the land who had inherited the land and stock from his father almost lost everything due to bad deals, bad management, and loss of cattle. One evening, there was a knock at the door, the door we had entered. It was bankers, a judge and sheriff or something like that. 
well, they had come to call the outstanding loans, and of course he didn't have the money to pay it back, so he had to deed large tracts of his family land over to the banks to repay the loans. Shortly after midnight, the gentleman left and rode out. Suddenly there was a shot heard, and the landowner had sat in the very chair in the parlor and put the very gun that hung over the mantle to his head and shot himself. His body was laid to rest in the family cemetery just outside the main house and adjacent to the parking lot. The tour guide also told us about a decade later when the landowner's son took over the family land that oil was discovered on the property and on mostly the property that still belonged to the family. So they went from almost losing the family land to later generations becoming very wealthy again. She also mentioned that during Halloween they do ghost tours and then stopped talking about the house being haunted. I think mostly due to the fact that my son was with us. However, he wasn't paying attention and was busy looking at other things. At almost the end of the tour, just as we were outside the house and around the back, my son looks over at the house and points to the window and says, what's that? I look and so did everyone else. Nothing was in the window. I asked him, what do you see? And he just walked away. He freaked out everyone and we all went back to the parking lot and my son and I went to the gift shop. I tried to ask him again what he saw and he said that I think it was just a pet. I didn't want to freak him out so we just bought some old time candy and went home. I don't know anything about the house or grounds prior to the visit and didn't know it was supposed to be haunted. I'm a 28 year old male and my fiance is a 27 year old female and we like to go on ghost walks whenever we go on vacations. Most cities have them if you know where to look and generally they're pretty cheesy. Some person drags you around, tells you the haunted history of the city and tries to freak you out. They tell you to take pictures and feel the energy. It's generic and pretty funny. We like it for a laugh and it's something fun to do. Boston, Salem, Savannah, Texas, New York. Seriously, we've been all over the U.S. and it never gets old. We recently went to Key West and they have a huge haunted history and a lot of tours, so of course we did one. The tour started out pretty generic, some 20-something year old girl taking us around with old time makeup on and showing us the hot spots. Robert the Dollhouse, Graveyard Walker, a haunted bar. My fiance and I laughed the whole time. Last stop was the Pirate Museum and when we stopped, we were already making jokes. We got in the museum and I felt sick almost immediately. My stomach started to roll, but I thought nothing of it. The guide started a speech about some people dying there and strange things happening. She was halfway through her story when I felt my head start to pound and I grabbed my fiance's arm because I thought I was going to puke in front of about 20 odd people. She looked at me weird and asked if I was okay, but I couldn't get the words out. I felt like I was choking and the air was gone from my lungs. I nodded at her though and motioned that I was okay because I didn't want to seem stupid. The guide took us to a different room and at that point I was holding onto my girl for dear life because my knees were about to give out. The floor beneath my feet was shaking and I started to heave. I'd never felt anything like it. The only way to describe it was like having the flu, just a queasy and sick feeling that wouldn't stop. My ears buzzed and my eyes stung, and I was pretty sure I was about to faint. Then I swear on my life, that's when I saw what could only be described as a blackout figure standing in the corner of the room, just watching our group. No face, no eyes, no real body, just an inky black figure. I opened my mouth to scream and it was just gone, like poof. I left the museum so fast and ran outside. I'm sure everyone thought that I was out of my mind. My breath returned to my lungs and I gasped when I got outside. The sick feeling was gone but my body felt stiff on the way home. I had wild dreams for a while after that. Things that just would haunt me. It took me a little bit to get over them. Even after we got home. My fiance poked fun at me, telling me I was faking and telling stories. But I will never forget what I saw. I will never forget the sick, overwhelming feeling. Key West is the scariest place that I've been to in the United States, and I'm sticking to it.
This happened around 2015, when I, a 25-year-old female, was alone at my upstairs apartment with my normally very calm, quiet, older cattle dog. I was sitting on the couch against the wall with the front door to my immediate left, on the same wall that couch was up against, so I could look to my left and the doorknob was arm's length and in clear view. I was scrolling on my phone through creepypastas and urban legends trying to find a good story that would really give me the chills. My dog was sleeping soundly at my feet. For the life of me, I cannot find the story that I had come across when a chill ran down my spine. I hear something and look over to see the doorknob rattling hard. I jumped up so fast, startled, but thinking it was an earthquake and looked around to notice nothing else was shaking. Still trying to process what was happening, I see my dog standing in front of the door, hair on the back of his neck standing straight up, tail poofed out, teeth barred, growling at the door. I had never seen him act like that before, but his face looked confused. The doorknob continued to rattle loudly, not like someone was turning it from outside, but shaking it fast and hard. I could physically see it shaking from a few feet away. It seemed to last minutes, but I'm sure the whole thing happened within 30 seconds. I, being freaked out quickly and without thinking, closed out the story on my phone and the rattling stopped. My dog and I looked at each other and exchanged confused glances. I stood there for a minute with my dog at my side and told myself that I was overreacting and just jumpy because I had been reading all those scary stories. I took a deep breath and said, Hello? No answer. I felt silly. Maybe my now ex was home early and just trying to get inside in a hurry or something. I reached for the doorknob, unlocked it, and opened the door. As the door opened, I took a step outside and leaned halfway out, looking around. Nothing. The stairs to downstairs were empty to my left, along the wall, and there was just a wall to my right with no one in sight. To this day, I don't know what caused the rattling. That day, I opted out of my scary story search and instead curled up on the couch with my dog and binge-watched episode of Friends the rest of the evening. Never had any more experiences in that apartment after that. You're probably wondering what the story was that I came across before the rattling started. I didn't get the chance to start reading it, but I remember it being something about a Japanese war nurse. I'm not even sure if it's actually related or if it was just a coincidence, but I'd love to hear your opinions either way. I've tried looking for it since then, but no luck. If anyone thinks they may know what it was and why this happened, I'm open to solving this case once and for all. Thank you so much for listening to all of the stories in this video. I hope you enjoyed them. And I also hope that you enjoy the extra rain at the end. I hope you have an excellent night's sleep, and I'll read to you again in the next video. Good night, everybody.